Hey there, everybody. So glad we get to be together today right here on Hunter Discovery Online. Thanks for joining us, especially those of you that are joining us for the very first time. If we have not met before, my name is Johnny, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Hunter Discovery United Methodist Church. Today, we continue our series called Exam, where we're taking a look at and hopefully adopting an ancient prayer practice to help us cope with today's craziness, because Today is kind of crazy, right? Our days are crazy. We live lives full of noise. For some of us, the lo noise is literal. Our lives are just noisy. Kids, jobs, whatever it is, there's a lot of actual noise in our lives. For others, the noise might be figurative. We just have a lot of distractions or worries or stress. Our screens, Twitter, 24-hour news, stress, crammed and cluttered schedules, politics, whatever it is, it's just crazy. And some of us have a little bit of all of that. Uh, crammed together. There's noise all around us. There's noise within us. And all of that craziness clutters up our lives and crowds, up, crowds out God's voice. Because in all of this time, we're hoping God will show up somewhere and help us out. And we wonder, where is that voice from heaven that is going to encourage us and comfort us and inspire us? It's going to give us clarity and direction. The hope for this series is uh, to introduce a prayer practice that has the power to slice right through all of that noise and craziness that we might see for ourselves um, what God is saying to us. Hear God for ourselves because God is always speaking. God is always present. Can we clear out the clutter? Can we clear out the noise so that we can hear God clearly? Today, we're taking a look at a secret ingredient for a deeper connection with ourselves, each other, and with God. It's uncomfortable but it's worth it. reading today from Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or, who can, who can, uh, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have truly done. And truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So think back to when you were in school. You ever been in class um, and the star student teacher's pet, the one that always has all the right answers, gets roasted in front of the class by the teacher. In my first year of seminary, I can remember being in one particular class that had that one particular person, you know the one, that knows everything and is the first to raise their hand. Look, there's no hate here. Like, they were usually right, and often I felt a lot smarter by hearing what they had to say, so I'm not hating on them by any means. They were very smart, very bright, and very good at school. <laughs> uh, and I love the contributions that they made most of the time. But even still, there was something kind of satisfying when they piped up confidently in class one day and the professor just roasted them right in front of everyone. It wasn't mean-spirited, but it felt brutal. And there was something inside of us that went, okay, they are human. They don't know <laughs> everything. Something a little satisfying about that. I don't know if we're supposed to be satisfied by that or not, but there was something satisfying about that. So Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, fresh off being called the rock, looking like the star pupil, now gets roasted in front of all of his friends and fellow disciples. 
right here, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. This is the section of Scripture literally right before what we read today. Jesus had asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And all his disciples were saying, oh, they say you're John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, maybe Jeremiah, or just some sort of prophet. And then Jesus follows up with, but who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter raises his hand, confidently pipes up and says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon. And I tell you now that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Immediately following this moment, Matthew's Gospel tells us that the next interaction between Jesus and his disciples is him telling them about the eventual and inevitable suffering that he is going to endure at the hands of the political and religious leaders of the time. Peter, feeling all brand new, fresh off his brand new name, takes Jesus aside Picture that for a second. Jesus is telling him this big important thing. And Peter, forgetting himself, grabbing Jesus by the arm and like taking him by the side and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he says to Jesus. This shall never happen to you. I can't tell if this was like Peter being like big and strong, like, no, I won't let anything happen to you, Jesus. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be there for you. Uh, you know, we all got your back sort of thing. Or if he was, you know, in in the rebuke side of what Peter said, if he's just saying, Lord, that's a silly idea. Why would you go into Jerusalem? Why would you face these people that have the the political and and the religious power, the institutional power to, like, harm you? Why would you do that? That's silly. This shall not be. We're going to do something else. But Jesus claps back at Peter, and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. In five short verses, Peter goes from the rock to Satan. And I can't help but picture the other disciples if they were there to see Jesus say this to Peter, all of them going like, ooh, <laughs> you know. They all love Peter, of course they did. They all loved each other, but, you know, still, Peter kind of stepping outside of his bounds and then Jesus putting him right back in his place. That had to have been fun for James and John and Uh, to see. One of the important aspects of being a disciple is the ability to be confronted and corrected by Jesus. I mean, if you read through the Gospels, it happens often with those that are following Jesus. They are constantly learning from Jesus. Again, Jesus not being mean-spirited, but as their teacher, as their leader, as their mentor, as their Savior, as their Messiah, as the Christ— is going to confront them because they are not perfect in hopes of correcting what it is that they think, the way that they act, the way that they treat one another. It's an uncomfortable truth and one that we are, you know, and and one that we are much more comfortable with when it's someone else that is getting confronted or corrected. We don't mind being the other disciples watching uh, watching Jesus say something to Peter. We don't mind being the person in class that watches somebody else get roasted by the teacher. We don't mind that part. But when it's us, something in us is hurt. We don't like being the ones to get confronted or corrected. Uh, I was told one time um, in my preaching life, it wasn't here, it was at a different place where I preached often. Uh, I was told one time, uh, Pastor, you don't preach about sin enough. You need to preach about sin more. And I said to this person, I knew this person fairly well so I could say this to them. I said, okay then, well tell me what your sin is and I'll try to preach a sermon on it. And they said, no, I I mean, why don't you preach on fill in the blank sin? And I said, well, is that your sin? And they said, no. And I said, well, why would you want to hear a sermon about somebody else's sin? The truth is, (laughs) as funny as that is to me, Uh, The truth is, we're all that guy. Like, I don't want to hear a sermon about my sin. I don't want to hear, I don't want to be convicted in the middle of church. I don't want to be called out. You know, I don't want any of that, right? I I want to be comforted. I want to be soothed. I want to be encouraged. I don't want to feel bad about anything. We are much more familiar and comfortable with the Jesus who comforts. And with good reason. Jesus is a comforter. And we all need to be comforted. But Jesus comforts and confronts. Jesus does both of those things, and he does them both very well. Now, there's two things that must be noted as we go forward talking about the confrontational nature of Jesus. 
Number one is this. Jesus almost always comforts first. If you look back through the stories uh, of Jesus and his encounter, there's the woman that's uh, brought before Jesus uh, by all of these men saying that she broke the law and she was by law deserving of, of death. Uh, and Jesus stood between these men and this woman until they all left. He protected her. He kept her safe. He comforted her first. He didn't turn and scold her and said, now do you promise never to sin again? And see guys, she never is going to sin again. You can leave now. No. He stood between those that would harm her and her until they are all left, until they were completely safe. He comforted her. And then only in that moment of complete trust and comfort and relational uh, connection, then Jesus said, go and sin no more. But he would never have said that until every, every one of her accusers was gone. That's important. Also look at Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector who Jesus had seen as needing some deep correction and some confrontation needed in his life, but instead, Jesus first just says, hey, Zacchaeus, I see you up there. I notice you. Why don't you come down? I'd love to have dinner at your house. And he spends time with Zacchaeus. He comforts Zacchaeus. He builds a relationship with Zacchaeus. And then he is able to confront Zacchaeus. Some of the areas in which Zacchaeus, it's always about opting in for Jesus. Jesus isn't just going to rush into somebody's life and say, hey, these are the things you need to do differently. But rather, he wants to make sure that he knows people full well before he can even begin the, the work of, of correcting or changing or transforming. Jesus is a safe and a comforting and a healing presence, and that ministry appears to be his first priority. It's only after the relationship is established, only after trust is established, only after a complete and genuine for you relationship is created, then the correction comes. Now let me be clear, this isn't a bait and switch. Jesus isn't healing and protecting and comforting people so that he can sneak attack them with some judgment. He's healing and protecting and comforting because that's what love does. And that's what Jesus does. But a part of that he knows that has to happen first before any correction could ever happen. Number two, the confronting and the correcting is almost always directed toward his disciples, those that are on the inside, those that have opted into his teaching and his leadership, those who have committed themselves to following him. He's not stopping random people on the street that have not said yes to following him and then trying to confront and correct them. But rather, those that have said yes, those that have said, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I will follow him. Then Jesus says, well, if you want to follow me, you're on the wrong path. I need to course correct you. In our time, Jesus is too often used to triangulate against folks who have never, ever committed themselves to following him. Those who have not called Jesus their Lord and Savior cannot be held accountable for not following Jesus. We want everybody to follow Jesus because we believe that's the best way to live, that Jesus wants the full and abundant life for all of us. But if somebody has not said yes to that, we cannot hold them accountable to that kind of a life. But for those of us who have called Jesus Lord, who have committed ourselves to following him, then we must allow ourselves to be confronted and corrected by Jesus. It's an important part of our call to discipleship and a critical ingredient to our spiritual growth. In other words, when we think about Jesus' ministry of confrontation and correction, and our first thought is that someone else needs to hear it, then we've missed the point. We've missed the point, and we've missed an opportunity. Today, we practice this willingness to be shaped and molded, confronted, corrected, coached, or whatever word you want to use, uh, by Jesus, the way we practice that today is through confession and repentance. Now, you've probably heard those words before. You probably have a negative reaction to those words. Remember our stories from, a, from before. We like it when it's somebody else, not so much when it's us. Repentance is an important part of our faith. Unfortunately, it's a word that too often gets weaponized and used to threaten people and scare them into faith, which is a complete misuse of the word and the practice of repentance. Again, if we're immediately thinking about somebody else, we're missing the point and missing an opportunity. To repent, it's translated literally from the Greek word metanoia, and it means to turn and go the other way. As if I know I'm going the wrong direction, so I need to start going the right direction. That moment of turning is repenting. Or to change one's minds. I used to think this about this thing, but now I've changed my mind on that. 
And because I've changed my mind, my behavior will then change. It's to reposition, to refocus, to realign our lives, to reconnect with God. And in fact, in repentance, it's not just with our relationship with God. It helps us reconnect with God, but it really helps us reconnect with ourselves as well, the true uh, people we were created to be by God. And it helps us correct, uh, con- reconnect with one another. Think about a relationship that was hurt or broken. And when that person that hurt you says, you know what, I was wrong, and I'm going to do that differently next time and forever. Wow, what a repair of a relationship, right? Repentance is important. It's so important. It's how we heal relationships. It's how relationships remain healthy with ourselves, with each other, and with God. But repentance, while it is important, it is near impossible without confession. If repentance is to turn and go a new way, confession is the moment of realization that we are in fact going the wrong way. If repentance is to change one's mind, confession is the acknowledgement that we actually need to do so be confronted by something and say, I wonder if I'm wrong about that. To admit that we are out of position, out of focus, or out of alignment. It's an honest self-awareness and the ability to admit that a change is needed. It's hard. (laughs) It's uncomfortable. I think this is why we don't do it so much. Uh, It takes great courage and bravery and humility. Maybe that's why Jesus spent so much time establishing relationships of trust and care. He knew that if anyone was going to trust him with their whole lives, he knew that they needed to not only feel, but actually be safe with him. And it's only from that place of safety and comfort and trust could the real transformation take place when we begin to confront the sin within ourselves. It can be tough. It can be scary especially if we're not used to admitting our wrongs. But if we can muster it, it really is the key to unlocking much of what we hope for for our lives. Let me put it simply this way. Confession is the pathway to connection. Confession is the pathway to connection. It's the pathway to connection with ourselves. We must confess those things within ourselves so that we might uh, be more aware of ourselves. We might give ourselves more grace. We can clean the junk out of our souls. There's a lot of guilt and a lot of shame that we might be carrying around, and part of that confession is to be able to get that out of us. Confession is also also the pathway of connection to others. It heals wounds. Uh, we, We talk a lot about truth and reconciliation among individuals, among peoples, and I've heard it said uh, that if for truth and, rec- re- truth and reconciliation are sequential. That truth has to happen first before there can ever be reconciliation. And that truth part is being able to tell the truth about what it is that we have done wrong, where we have fallen short, where we have not held up our end of the bargain in our relationship, where we might have reacted or done things that we do- if we had a second chance at it, we wouldn't do it that way again to be able to admit our wrongs and move toward reconnection with others. Confession is the starting place for that. And it's also a pathway to connection with God. It helps us draw near to that transforming love because here's what happens naturally when we're holding on to guilt, when we're holding on to shame, when we know that that we've done some things wrong, we have fallen short in some areas, but we feel afraid to let that out and give it to God and to, to confess that you know, what ends up happening is we end up withdrawing because we believe that we do not deserve or we cannot be near God. So we withdraw from God. And and when we withdraw from God, while God never withdraws from us and is always constantly pursuing us and coming at us with grace, we are holding our hands up to that grace. We're not allowing it to fully invade our hearts and our souls and wash us clean again. We feel unworthy to be in God's presence, even though God, throughout time and history and our scriptures and, and, and beyond, has, has made it clear and has proven that God draws near to us. Even when we are unfaithful, God is faithful, but for some reason we don't, we don't draw near to God. So that confession is that act of drawing back in, leaning into God's love and grace so that we might be transformed again. That's why confession is an important part of the examine prayer that we've been talking about. 
you know, a prayer that we can pray, pray daily, even honestly a couple times a day, or even just weekly or monthly. But the more often we practice it, the more effective it is. And part of the examined prayer, as we do acknowledge God's presence, we pay attention to our bodies as, as we become present to God, we give thanks, we go over the, the joyful parts of our day, but we also confess. That's a part of it. We look back and notice moments that we didn't act or respond how we might have hoped. Moments where we didn't quite live up to our calling as a follower of Christ. We look back over our day or over our week, however long it's been. We look back over that recent past and we look for moments where, where, where maybe we didn't treat somebody the way we would love to treat them. And we start to think, okay, well, is there, is there someone that I need to make amends with? You know, is there something that I need to release from my heart and my soul? That moment of confession in the prayer of examine uh, is an important part of that prayer because we know it's an important part of our healing and our wholeness. Now, it can be practiced without the whole examine prayer. The practice of confession is just a, a, an important part of what we do as Christians. But, it, but within the prayer of examine, we include it because we know it's such a critical piece. So the question we must ask ourselves as we leave this is, how often are we practicing confession? Let me be clear, uh, we all come from different faith backgrounds and faith cultures and denominations and things, and we might have a different idea about what this means. When I say, are you practicing confession, I don't mean, are you scheduling a time to come to the church and sit in a box with me and tell me all the bad things that you did and that way I can absolve you of your sin. I, that's not what I'm talking about. And confession doesn't always involve another human being. Sometimes it's just being able to acknowledge it within ourselves. It does often in include another human being. If you have wronged someone else, confessing to them is an important part of healing that relationship. But it doesn't always include that. Sometimes it's just something that we have acknowledged within ourselves, a thought pattern or whatever that we need to confess. A withdrawing from God. That's just a personal choice that we've been making and we've got to confess. God, I've, I've withdrawn from you. I want to come back near to you again. Confession isn't necessarily a... a um, clearly defined practice in that there is a particular place and a particular person you have to do it with. But it is something that we need to practice often. And sometimes it involves another human. Sometimes it will involve your pastor. Sometimes it just involves you and God. But how often are you taking stock, taking inventory of your life in the little moments throughout your day where you felt like you might have fallen a little short or you wish you could have done differently? How quickly are we recognizing those moments when we don't respond as we would hope and then bravely humbling ourselves in order to admit and apologize and move toward new practices and habits and responses. Remember, confession and repentance, despite how often it gets used by some faith leaders in church cultures, is not meant to be about shame and guilt. Rather, it's meant to be an invitation to realignment with Christ. Look again at Peter's interaction with Jesus. Peter was misaligned with Jesus. He misunderstood what Jesus was about and what it was going to call Jesus to do. And when he spoke up about it, Jesus corrected him. Get behind me, Satan. But note that that course correction, that confrontation, it doesn't disqualify Peter. That, that phrase, get behind me, Satan, we often hear that as a dismissal. Right? And, and Peter wasn't dismissed. In fact, Peter was still the rock as he was called five verses ago. Right? Like, rather, you know, Jesus doesn't fire him. He says, get behind me. Or, or put another way, follow me again. Jesus is being quite literal. Like, get, get back behind me, Peter. Like, you're meant to follow me. I mean, you grabbed me by the arm. You took me aside like you've forgotten who the Savior here is. Get behind me. F follow me. Come back into alignment. It's discipleship language. Jesus isn't calling Peter out. He's calling Peter back in. It's an invitation to realign the relationship that they had before. Confession. The practice of confession is the pathway to better, deeper, healthier connection with ourselves, with others, and with God so that we might 
be able to repent, to refocus, and to realign ourselves with the goodness of Christ so that we might get back in the groove with Jesus rather than wandering or straying off. Even if we have the best of intentions, as I believe Peter did, sometimes we do have the best of intentions, but we just need that little reminder that Jesus is Lord and that we are to follow Christ. It's a tough practice, I know. It can be uncomfortable, especially if we're new to it. But it is so worth it, especially after that first time when we practice it and we realize we really are safe with God. And we feel that grace flood into our lives, wash us clean as we begin again. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of Scripture that still meets us here today right where we are that can find us in whatever place that we are living, um, whatever season of life that we're in, and has words of wisdom for us. We know, God, that the, the act of humbling ourselves and being able to confess our sin and shortcomings, you know, God, that we struggle with that. And now we know that we struggle with it. And we just pray for your Holy Spirit, to reassure us of your love and your grace and your welcome so that we might have more courage to step forward, to be able to confess our sins to you and to one another so that we may repent with joy as we turn and realign ourselves with you. God, we know that life with you and life with Christ is the best possible life to live. And sometimes, even with the best of our intentions, we find ourselves straying away. By your love, by your Holy Spirit, by your grace, God, hold us together with you. We invite that confrontation. We invite that correction into our lives so that we might remain with you and the blessing that it is to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, y'all. Pastor Johnny, thanks for joining us today at Huddle Discovery Online. Be sure to drop a comment down below. Let us know you're here. And if you're so inclined, share this video. We love it when you share your church with your friends. And be sure that you're subscribed to this channel so that you stay notified when new content drops. If you're just checking us out today, we'd love to invite you to worship with us in person on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. here at Huddle Discovery United Methodist Church. Also, be sure that you're signed up for our email newsletter so that you can stay up to date with all that's going on in the life of the church and find out how you can get involved. If there's any way myself or Pastor Kyron can connect with you this week, click the connection link in the description of this video. Whether you have questions about the church, membership, baptism, small groups, youth or children, if you have a prayer request or you'd like to find out uh, how to serve or whatever it is, let us know. We'd love to connect with you. And finally, if you have an offering that you'd like to give to the church today, visit our website at huddodiscovery.org slash give. There you can give digitally, a one-time gift, or set up a reoccurring and automated offering. You'll also find their information to mail in your offering if you prefer that. Grace and peace, y'all. See you again soon.